appreciate it, man. Get the end of the lottery. Lottery schmottery. Just send me my iPhone. All right. And he heard a snap. Oh, no. I didn't know you were doing it. Uh, we have. Oh, okay. got, a lot of, uh, got a lot of afro. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Russ Yoshia, I'm one of uh, Chris Fox's ultrasound fellows. And I trained at UC Davis for residency in emergency medicine. Here doing a fellowship now. And we're going to teach you fast scans. So let's take off our gloves. Let's get ready to have some fun, huh? Nice. Hi, I'm Dan Kilpatrick, and normally I race cars for a living, but I'm here at UC Irvine just to help make the medical student <laughs> Celebrity status. How you guys doing? I'm Shane Summers. I'm an Army guy from um, San Antonio, Texas. I'm one of Chris Fox's, uh, well actually I'm the Ocean Director. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> I'm the assistant to the Ocean Director, <laughs> and uh, we really appreciate you guys coming, and uh, uh, we really appreciate having you guys so on the rotation. I'm sorry we couldn't be here today, but... Cap oh, Navy. Captain, <laughs> Captain Shane Summers. Oh, Captain, my Captain. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> Wait, right. on your back, mouth up. <laughs> All right, first thing I'm going to go over is uh, when you first approach the machine, which also means when you first come on shift, we've got to make sure the machines are clean and ready to go. Normally, when you approach one of these machines, because the last student did a, didn't do a very good job, and you should reprimand them for this, I would approach the machine with gloves on, because these things are disgusting. You never know where these probes have been, you know what I'm saying? Then, when I get some of these little uh, not-for-baby baby wipes, see that? It's not just for infants and toddlers, no big people without any uh, private parts, and no uh, female people without any parts either, all right? So you're going to get a couple of these uh, cavity wipes, and they don't let the name fool you. They're not just for cavities, they're for all sorts of things, all right? When you approach the machine, you take out one of, these, you take out one of the, the little uh, cavity wipes. We're just going to clean the probe off. We're just going to get all these little nuts, nooks and crannies, sort of like, uh, like flossing the probe, if you will, but we don't have any floss. We're going to use cavity wipes instead. So we're going to wipe this. Oh, I need oh, yeah, yeah, one more. Okay. So which one? This one? Okay, so that takes care of how to clean the machine, and the machine is now ready for use. One final point, and this is a very, very important point, because again, these probes are very expensive, and we have to be very careful with them. There's only two places where this probe should be. That's in your hand, or in the stand. This is a high-frequency microcurvilinear probe. You can see the application of the probe is with the indicator in the up portion. Uh, kind of like a thumbs up. <laughs> Danica Patrick loves it. Well then, uh, gently insert the probe. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing we want to cover is... Wait for it. <laughs> Okay. The screen uniformly dark. If you turn it way up, the screen is going to be uniformly bright. The right amount of gain would be somewhere between where the liver, um, the liver parenchyma has a slightly increased echogenicity compared to the renal cortex. So you can see how the renal cortex right here is a little bit less bright or less echogenic, as we would say, than the liver parenchyma. So this is probably the optimal gain setting right about there. Uh, when you're doing a fast scan, you're looking for fluid in this pouch, Morrison's pouch, in the uh, hepatorenal recess. <laughs> oh, I see what you're talking about now, right, yeah, I mean, you definitely don't want to turn a blind eye to that, am I right? I mean, come on now. <laughs> So let's go ahead and get started. You're going to put a little um, uh, coupling gel on the transducer probe. Um, you always want to make sure your indicator, which is uh, T for Toshiba, is always in the upper left-hand corner of the screen here. Um, okay. Now, another thing about the probe when you do ultrasound scanning is this is the indicator or the index. Um, this should always be to the patient's right or to the patient's head when scanning. Um, there's only one... Uh, 
There's only one instance where that rule does not hold true, and that is in the peristernal long axis view of the heart. But otherwise, if you keep the index to the patient's right or the index to the patient's head while scanning, and you make sure the indicator's in the upper left-hand corner of this ultrasound screen, you'll be okay. All of your orientation will be correct. Don't try this at home. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with a fast scan. So in order to do the fast scan, you're going to start with a coronal view of the right upper quadrant. The indicator is right here. It's going to be towards the patient's head. And you're going to start, it's going to be a little cold here. And it's going to be kind of in between the ribs, and there's a liver. And this is the coronal view of the, uh, the right upper quadrant. This is the liver, this is the kidney, and this is Morrison's pouch, and this is the diaphragm right here. A couple things you can adjust while you're acquiring your images. This right here is the gain function. This is the amplification of sound energy. So if you turn it way down, it's going to make the, the screen uniformly dark. If you turn it way up, the screen is going to be uniformly bright. The right amount of gain would be somewhere between where the liver, um, the liver parenchyma has a slightly increased echogenicity compared to the renal cortex. So you can see how the renal cortex right here is a little bit less bright or less echogenic, as we would say, than the liver parenchyma. So this is probably the optimal gain setting right about there. Uh, when you're doing a fast scan, you're looking for fluid in this pouch, Morrison's pouch, in the uh, hepatorenal recess. Okay. So if I wanted to freeze this image to uh, show my attending or show the trauma surgeon that it was negative, you could hit this freeze button right here and it'll hold it. If you want to go back and, and, oh, I didn't get the right picture right there, you can go back with the trackball and it'll scan through the last... 430 stills that you did while I was just scanning. Okay? Okay, so the next view for a fast scan, we're going to hit unfreeze and we're going to go back to scanning the patient. So we're going to move to the subxiphoid view of the heart. Again, want, be cognizant of where your indicator is. It needs to be the patient's right for this. It's going to be, sorry, it's a little cold here. It's going to be right in the subcostal space and it's going to be somewhere between the, the uh, right subcostal margin using the livers and acoustic windows or the sub xiphoid space. Somewhere in this range you're going to find it. So I like to start near the liver and go through the liver. Sorry, it tickles a little bit. Go through the liver and uh, so because it uh, doesn't attenuate sound very well, so sound can go right through to the heart. And you can kind of sweep over. Take a deep breath. Helps to take a deep breath to get that subcostal view in. So I can see part of my heart's off the screen, so I need to change my depth here. Uh, I'm, go, uh, I'm making the sound penetrate deeper, or I'm paying more attention to echoes that are coming from deeper structures. So now I'm imaging structures that are as far as 18 centimeters deep. Here's your depth indicator on the, on the left-hand corner of the screen. All right. So the heart, um, it's a four-chamber view of the heart. What we're looking for in a trauma situation is global contractility of the heart. Is it, um, beaten away at 120 beats per minute with the ventricle uh, walls totally collapsing uh, and is there fluid around the heart. So she looks like she's got normal contractility and I do not see any pericardial fusion. So because you guys uh, could see on that last subcostal view, it wasn't optimal, it couldn't really see the apex of the heart and that wasn't because of operator error because I'm really good at ultrasounds. It really has to do with some people just, especially in trauma patients, uh, their anatomy is not always conducive to getting a good subcostal view of the heart. About 15% of the time, you're not going to get a great subcostal view. And that's why we've added uh, another view, kind of the standard uh, uh, additional view in the FAST scan called the peristernal long axis view. And uh, patients, uh, patients who have poor subcostal views of the heart more than make up for it usually in uh, peristernal long axis view of the heart. So. Remember when I was telling you guys earlier about the indicator um, being always to the right of the patient's head? Well, this is the one instance um, where the indicator actually will go to the patient's left. Um, for the peristernal long axis view, you're going to go uh, either the second, third, or fourth intercostal space, very near the sternum, almost, you'll be almost on top of the sternum, and then you'll move over, slide over into the intercostal space, um, just maybe about a centimeter or two to the left of the sternum. You want the indicator to the patient's elbow, okay? and uh, there it comes into view. So she's a good example of 
somebody who it was difficult to acquire a subcostal image but has a great parasternal uh, long axis view. I will say on this image that because now we're right on top of the heart, whereas before we were going through the liver, uh, my depth is too deep to image the structure of interest. So um, I'm wasting all of this real estate down here. So I'm going to decrease my depth a little bit um, to make the heart fill up the screen. And look how, see how the heart fills up the entire screen. I get a good resolution on all the structures of interest. Just took a deep breath there and slow. By the way, just for uh, teaching purposes, here's uh, the uh, an anatomy just to give you guys a refresher. Uh, th this is the left atrium of the heart, the left ventricle. This is the mitral valve. This is the aortic outflow tract, and this is the right ventricle. Um, what we're looking for is fluid around the heart, which I see none of, and global contractility of the heart, which looks appropriate. View in the fast scan is the left upper quadrant view or the splenorenal view. This can be a little bit more difficult to acquire. Uh, Wherever you found the right upper quadrant view, keep in mind that uh, uh, the liver kind of pushes everything down on the right. So uh, on, when you get the left upper quadrant view, the uh, kidney tends to be a little bit higher and a little bit more posterior. So just go a little bit higher and more posterior than where you did on the, uh, where you found the Morrison's couch on the right. So again, indicator back to the patient's right, to the, to the patient's head. Um, and you're just going to put it right there. A little bit more posterior, a little bit higher, and you can see I'm almost, to, you know, my uh, probe is flat and almost to the to the to the bed. But uh, this is the splenorenal recess. If I go a little bit more caudal, I'll get her entire kidney. But uh, sometimes these ribs can get in the way, and you can have a patient take a deep breath, and that'll bring the rib shot out of the way. Take a deep breath for me. Look how nice splenorenal view. The, uh, there you can see there's no fluid in that space. Okay. Okay. So the next view, um, the final view, is the suprapubic view. Uh, you're looking for fluid in the retrovesicular space. Again, I'm wasting real estate here. Um, a little bit uh, too deep. Okay. I'm looking for fluid back here in, in uh, the space here. I don't see any fluid. You're also, right now, the, patient's, the indicator is to the patient's right. Um, I'm about a centimeter uh, cephalad to the pubic bone and I've got my probe angled about 45 degrees caudally. Um, so we scan through that view and then we turn the probe with the indicator of the patient's head and now I have a sagittal view. Um, and I'm looking for fluid um, in the retrovesicular space and also in the pouch of Douglas back here. Point out the vaginal stripe in the uterus. Okay, so it's a little bit difficult uh, on her because you need to have a completely full bladder to get a tra good transabdominal view of the uterus. But this is the fundus of the uterus. This is the cervix down here. The vaginal stripe is going to come up like this. Uh, and uh, this is the patient's head. This is the patient's feet. This is anterior and this is posterior. She keeps laughing. <laughs> so, I guess, okay. Another thing is, uh, you point out on the machine, there's a, a function called time gain compensation or TGC. That's these things over here. Um, what that does is instead of the gain changing the brightness overall for the entire screen, that'll change the brightness on a certain level of the screen. So in this view, oftentimes because of uh, posterior acoustic enhancement, the far field is uh, much brighter than it normally should be. So you can turn down the gain a little bit uh, by moving these buttons down and it makes it less bright in the far field. Let me just show you if I was to increase it all the way, it would make the far field really bright but the near field normal but if I'm moving all the buttons uh, just here I'm compensating uh, for deeper echoes and making it um, less bright in the far field without changing the overall uniform brightness of the screen okay so uh, we've now extended the fast scan to include ultrasound of the chest to uh, exclude pneumothorax we found in studies that uh, the sensitivity of supine chest x-ray for trauma patients in the detection of pneumothorax is uh, poor, um, especially in comparison to ultrasound. So we're now adding this as routine as part of our extended FAST scan. So I'll show you how to acquire those windows. Now for this scan you want to use higher frequency probe uh, because uh, the pleural line is actually very superficial just underneath the ribs and we want to use the optimal or the highest frequency possible to image 
uh, the structure of interest. And since it's so superficial, we can get away with using a higher frequency probe. Okay, so uh, we've now extended the fast scan to include ultrasound of the chest to uh, exclude pneumothorax. We found in studies that uh, the sensitivity of supine chest x-ray for trauma patients in the detection of pneumothorax is uh, poor, um, especially in comparison to ultrasound. So we're now adding this as routine as part of our extended fast scan. So I'll show you how to acquire those windows. Now for this scan, you want to use higher frequency probe uh, because uh, the pleural line is actually very superficial just underneath the ribs and we want to use the optimal or the highest frequency possible to image uh, the structure of interest and since it's so superficial we can get away with using a higher frequency probe. So again to switch the probe uh, go up to probe menu and let's see PLT805 okay now I'm touch screen now it'll change my footprint um, this is a linear footprint. The indicators to the patient's right. All the patient's information is in. Okay. Again, I want to make sure the indicator is to the patient's head um, or to the patient's right. I'm going to start out here by going to the patient's head, and I'm going to put it just in a second, third, and fourth intercostal space, just on the chest. Make uh, probably make a vicular line. So, my picture here, I'm again is. Um, this is all wasted real estate. I'm imaging 10 centimeters deep, which is unnecessary. Um, and it's lead to poor image quality. So I'm going to change my depth again. Okay. Okay. Now my picture also seems a little uniformly dark, so I might change my gain a little bit, turn it up a little bit. Okay. And just to point out the anatomy, this is the second rib, this is the third rib, and this is the intercostal space. Uh, this brightly echogenic line uh, just underneath the ribs, in between the two, is the pleural line, the, uh, where the visceral parietal pleura rub together or slide against each other. Uh, what the ultrasound findings we're looking for is a sliding lung line. Uh, to, to rule out pneumo. Uh, if there is sliding lung, we're going to basically rule out pneumothorax by seeing this ultrasonographic finding. This is a finding that is made by the visceral parietal pleura rubbing up against each other. So if they're rubbing up against each other, there's no air in between. Uh, what we're looking for is this sliding line. You can see in her, uh, these little, there's like almost ants marching up, again, up and down this brightly echogenic line. This lung is sliding back and forth. And sometimes you see these little reverberation artifact or comet tail artifact coming down from the pleural line. That means there is no pneumothorax there because those two, uh, parietal uh, those two pleural surfaces are basically sliding against each other. Now, I'm going to show you guys uh, another way you can rule out pneumothorax. Instead of using the 2D mode, we can change the mode on the ultrasound machine to use the M mode. M mode stands for motion mode, and here's the button right here. Um, motion mode detects moving structures or moving reflectors at a certain distance on a certain scan line. So when I hit M mode, it's going to pull up this scan line, which I can move with the trackball back and forth. I'm going to pull this. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to take this scan line and I'm going to put it right over, right in between the ribs, going straight down so the pleural line is, uh, it's cutting right through the pleural line. And what this, what, what this screen is, is doing down here is detecting motion along this particular line over time. So this bright line here corresponds to this bright line here. You can see it's two centimeters on the M mode line and it's two centimeters on the 2D or B mode line. What this is showing is that there is motion along the visceral and pleural, pleural interface, so therefore there is no air in between because the two surfaces are moving back and forth against each other. It's just another way of looking at the same thing. And what we're looking for, again, I'm going to change my depth a little bit. I turn up the far field TGC also. It's a little bit dark in the far field here, so I'm going to turn up the uh, far field TGC. See how I just slide these um, buttons over a little bit and it makes the far field a little bit brighter. Uh, without changing the near field. And I can see clearly here, um, I'm going to hit freeze so I can show you guys. Um, what we're looking for in, to rule out pneumothorax is we're, we're looking for what's called sky ocean beach. And uh, basically, uh, this is the sky, this is the ocean, you see how it's a little bit different echogenicity, and this is the beach. You can see how it looks like a sandy beach. Uh, this beach is demonstrating kind of shaggy motion along this brightly echogenic pleural line right here. 
If there's motion along that pleural line, that means there's no air in between those two interfaces and therefore excludes the pneumothorax. Okay, so just to review, this is the screen you're looking for. Um, this is the M mode, this is the B mode, and they're superposed on each other. That's called duplex imaging. Uh, this depth of three centimeters cor corresponds to this depth of three centimeters on the M mode image. This little section of tissue one centimeter down corresponds to the chest wall. This little section corresponds to the intercostal muscle between the two ribs. And this, um, at a depth of two centimeters, is the pleural line. At the pleural line, there's motion between the two, uh, the two, the visceral and parietal pleura, therefore it shows uh, a lot of motion on the screen and therefore it excludes pneumothorax, whereas there's not a whole lot of motion in the intercostal muscles or chest wall. Uh, if there was a pneumothorax, there would be no beach. It would just, the whole screen would almost look what's called like frozen echoes because there's no motion along this interface. So the whole screen would just look frozen. So I'm going to try to show you guys on Elena here. Sorry, Danica. Where are you um, what it would look like. Now, whenever you get kind of lost in the ultrasound uh, and you're like, whoa, what's going on? Just go back to 2D and it'll bring back, hit this 2D button and it'll bring back, uh, bring you back to home base here. All right, so I'm going to, again, I'm going to try to scan uh, and show you guys what a pneumothorax may look like uh, by having the patient take a deep breath. If she takes a deep breath, there's really not a whole lot of motion uh, along that line. Uh, so, therefore, it would look like no beach or frozen echoes. A little bit superficial. I'm going to change my depth here. This is the pleural line again. This is the ribs. This is the pleural line in between. So breathe normal. You see the lung sliding. Okay, put the, put the M mode on. Okay, M mode. It's going to bring up my scan line. I'm going to put it right, right in the middle here. Nice beach. There's motion over, t over time at the pl uh, parietal pleural interface. So it looks like a nice beach here. Now she's going to hold her breath. Not move a muscle. Still a little bit of slightly lung sliding there. Can you take a deep breath and hold it completely and then don't move? There. That's a good mimic of there. Perfect. Okay. So see how this, the screen is almost uniformly frozen. Uh, there's no shaggy, wavy, sandy beach at the bottom there in the far field. So we'll go back and show you what a normal end mode looks like. Nice beach. Say your feelings about the uh, the book, Fox's book. It sucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Two thumbs down. No, it's pretty good. There's an error in there. What's um, that? When you talk about the parasternal long view, the one that goes here, sternum, mm -hmm. move it over in between the ribs, turn it. There's an error because your book says pointed to the right shoulder, when in fact it should be pointed to the patient's left elbow, unless. Well, actually, it depends on where your indicator is on the screen. That's why we stress that your indicator should always be in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. When you go to your preset menu, there's a preset button down here that can, uh, and you can choose your application. Well, when you choose cardiac, it's going to. Oh wait, my. Uh, oh wait, it's going to. Uh, completely switch the indicator over to the left because the cardiologists like to be all cattywampus and uh, go against the radiology world. So um, the preset for cardiology puts the indicator to the patient's or to the upper right hand corner of the screen which makes everything backwards for our purposes. So Dr. Fox was indeed correct actually. If the indicator is the upper right hand corner of the screen then your indicator on the probe should be to the patient's right shoulder. So I'm going to be bruised up tomorrow. These we really appreciate you sacrificing. Beaten and battered <laughs> women syndrome. <laughs> Just like racing in the Indy 500 race. Seriously. <laughs> this is traumatic. Right, you don't want to give our fellowship a bad name, okay?
I don't want you going back to Pan and saying that, uh, or Pecom or whatever it is. <laughs> what do you mean, whatever it is? <laughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> All right, let's go. Gallbladder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next study we're going to teach you, uh, we're going to give you a quick crash course on the gallbladder because uh, it can be a somewhat difficult study, and uh, we're more than happy to work with you, and uh, the faculty is more than happy to work with you at any time on shift to help you make your gallbladder scans better. It's always nice when you're going to scan a patient's gallbladder to kind of get nice clean towels and kind of tuck them in so she doesn't get, they don't get uh, a bunch of sticky jelly all over their clothes and you can have the patient kind of... Some of these towels Sorry. with sticky <laughs> jelly all over We're them. We're scared. Take a bunch of old sticky towels out of the, <laughs> out of the hamper and that just... One's, that one's clean. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's wet and sticky. That's our we motto. oftentimes have patients complaining, so it's very good to uh, oh, nice, get a Shane. nice, clean, fresh towel. Patient satisfaction, model satisfaction. Okay. All right. So for the gallbladder scan, you can use the C60 probe because it's a low-frequency probe, good abdominal probe. Uh, you can also use the phased array, small footprint, because sometimes the gallbladder is uh, best visualized in between the ribs, a little bit higher. So it's got a small footprint, so it's easy to get between the ribs, and it's also low-frequency. You can also use the microconvex probe because uh, it's low frequency and it can get between the ribs, the curved array here. Uh, for this purpose, I'm going to use the C60 probe. Uh, I'm going get, to get the gel in there. Make sure your probe is clean from prior scans. Um, gel them up, and uh, we're going to start. Make sure the indicator is the upper left hand corner of the screen. The patient's information is in. We've got the indicator. I'm very cognizant of where the indicator is. And we're going to do what's called a subcostal sweep which is we're going to start in the subxiphoid recess here and we're going to scan over in a sagittal plane because it's sagittal because the index is to the patient's head and we're going to kind of scan over subcostally through the liver until I see the gallbladder. Now look, I don't really see a whole lot. I just see a lot of gas. Um, and uh, so uh, some ways, and I have to do this a lot with gallbladder scans, it, to optimize your view is to have the patient take a deep breath because um, it will bring the gallbladder fossa out underneath the ribs. Now see how the liver gets a lot prettier. And there's a the gallbladder. It's the most anterior tubular structure in the abdomen. And if you were to put flow on it, there's no flow in it. So I know that's the gallbladder. Show us how you put the flow on this. On okay. The Toshiba, Zario. So uh, there's many forms of Doppler, but all Doppler does is tell if there is flow coming from a particular reflector. Um, CDI stands for color Doppler. Imaging. Uh, imaging. Uh, that just says, that, that brings up uh, some sort of color scale that can tell if there is flow, yes, no, and what direction that flow is going. Blue means the flow is going away from the probe. It doesn't mean venous flow. It just means the probe is, the blood in, these, uh, in the portal venous system here is flowing away from the probe, whereas the uh, red and yellow means flow is coming towards the probe. Uh, so that the color, the CDI gives us information on flow, yes, no, and directionality. Bart, blue away, red towards. Uh, the next form of Doppler is called pulse wave Doppler, PW. And what that does is that brings up a set of gates that you can put over. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pardon me again. <laughs> <laughs> so this is power Doppler, this is, uh, or, I'm sorry, this is pulse wave Doppler, this is spectral Doppler. This gives us information on waveforms. As you can see, well, I have the gates placed over the aorta, it has a good arterial triphasic waveform. To get back to regular imaging, brightness mode, just hit 2D. Home base, 2D, when you get lost. So back to gallbladder, we kind of got off kilter there. Oh, do you want me to show them power Doppler? Yeah, sure. Okay. That was the aorta, by the way. <laughs> All right, so back to the aorta. I'm going to show you guys uh, another Doppler technique. Uh, remember, color Doppler uh, gives us information on flow and directionality. The power Doppler is in between. That just That's one color, and it doesn't tell us about which direction the flow is going. It just tells us if, there, if flow is there. We use power Doppler a lot because it's less dependent upon imaging angle and it's more sensitive to low flows. So you can see it's more sensitive to low flows because it's picking up flow from everywhere. It's picking up artifact. motion, artifact, everywhere. 
Um, I could actually turn that down by turning down the gain. Oh, where's the color gain on this? The color gain is on the actual color Doppler button. There. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you can rotate that to bring less or more. Color. So I turned down the CDI, I turned down the color you gain. You can see CG on the right panel there. CG is color gains at 21. And, and 2D uh, gains at 82. Decreasing his depth, maximize screen real estate. And we only use color really to for fun. We don't really use it much for diagnostic purposes 98% of the time. The only time I use it diagnostically is if I'm looking at the testicles or sometimes the ovaries for flow or sometimes around the appendix when it's inflamed or an ectopic pregnancy for increased flow or ring of fire. Otherwise I don't really I don't really bother so much with the dollar. I mean, it's cool to look at, it's pretty, but um, it outlines the vasculature pretty well, but we don't really use it uh, diagnostically very much in emergency ultrasound. So back to the gallbladder. Back to the gallbladder, okay. So subcostal sweep, I'm going to sweep over, I'm going to have the patient take a deep breath. I've got the indicator to the patient's head, and I see the liver, and that's a good acoustic window here. And can you take a deep breath for me? There's the gallbladder coming to the screen here. Oops, please. Big deep breath. Deep breath and hold it. There. Beautiful. So here's a nice long axis view of the gallbladder. This is the portal vein and this is the MILF or median inner lobar fissure that joins the, um, the long axis of the gallbladder to the portal venous system. It almost looks like an exclamation point. You're going to scan through this and make sure there's no stones in there. And they're usually in the posterior part of the gallbladder in the dependent portions brightly echogenic stones with shadowing. I don't see any at all. This right here is a little fold in, in the uh, neck of the gallbladder. Normal. Okay. You're doing great. You want to take a break on the deep breath? Okay. Whenever you're ready, you're going to take another deep breath and hold it. Okay. So the best way to... Uh, now, uh, anytime in ultrasound, if you want to go from long axis to cross section, you just turn 90 degrees from where you're at. And now I've got a cross sectional view of the gallbladder. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, change my depth a little bit, and then I'm going to freeze it. Oh, now I lost my picture, so I'm going to go back with the trackball on freeze, and it'll go back to that to where I was before, so I can kind of get a good view um, of what I was uh, before to kind of measure the wall. So I'm going to show you guys how to measure the wall of the gallbladder in transverse axis. Um, it's always best to measure the anterior wall of the gallbladder, the one closest to the probe. You're going to go to caliper. And it'll bring up these uh, calipers here that you can kind of place on the wall of the gallbladder. Uh, you can hit set. And set and set again. And it puts the measurement down here at 2.5 millimeters. And an abnormal uh, gallbladder wall would be 3 millimeters or greater. That's a normal gallbladder wall measurement. Um, you're also looking around the gallbladder for any anechoic fluid collection or pericholcystic fluid. So now I've got that picture saved. I've hit record, by the way, so all this is available for QA. I'm going to hit unfreeze. Uh, now I've kind of lost my space here, but maybe I have to change my depth a little bit more. Okay, and then I see the gallbladder again. Take a deep breath and hold it. Good. Okay. So I've got the long axis view. I'm going to go 90 degrees, and now I've got a transverse view. I'm going to fan through the transverse view of the gallbladder and make sure I don't see any stones and all planes. Okay. And then. Now, I'm going to show you guys really quickly how to get the common bile duct. You want to breathe? Okay. Whenever you're ready. Okay. This is the view you want to get the common bile duct. You want the long axis view of the gallbladder. You're going to find the portal vein, uh, which is the dot of the exclamation point. The portal vein is transverse axis. So in order to get the portal vein uh, to get in the long axis view, which is what you want, you're going to turn 90 degrees until it stretches out in its long axis view. I that's it. that's the full thing right there. And the, gall, the common bile duct is just anterior to the portal vein running completely parallel. So I'm going to show you guys that again. I'll try to freeze it up for you. Okay. So, take a deep breath and hold it. Okay. Try to keep your pictures in the center. Portal vein, 90 degrees. This is portal vein in the long axis view. And that's going to be the common bile duct just anterior to the portal vein and running completely parallel. If I was to put flow on that, there would be no flow. 
and it's usually in this way it's like um, about a third of the diameter a third to one half the diameter of the portal vein which is normal and you're going to measure inner wall to inner wall on that common bile duct notice that just to the right of the screen from the CBD we lose it because there's uh, air there okay. in the duodenum or bowel gas there causing it. and that's the whole conundrum there with the gallbladder is dealing with that second portion of the duodenum uh, Shane, show the technique to get rid of the duodenum by rolling the patient. Okay. Do you want me to show you how to measure this real quick? Yeah, I think I discussed it pretty well. The normal size is. Oh, he's going to zoom in. Five. So you hit to zoom, you hit uh, the, the depth button is the same as the zoom button. You just push the button in. Oh, crap. So we're picking up a, a lot of gas from the duodenum. Uh, the C loop of the duodenum sits kind of right in the same area. And anytime uh, uh, air is the ultrasound, uh, ultrasound enemy. It scatters ultrasound sound everywhere and makes your picture look uh, not so resolute. So a good way to do this uh, um, is to roll the patient on the left side. So go ahead and do that for me. That takes all of the bowel contents and moves them gravitationally dependent towards the bed and it brings the gallbladder fossa out from underneath the uh, rib cage there and gets all that bowel gas out of the way. So you can see how I had a little bit of a better picture here. Uh, take a deep breath and hold it. So I have a nice little picture of it all louder there by getting all my bowel loops out of the way. The next application we're going to do is the aorta. So one other tidbit that I'm going to add here too is you approach the patient, <clears throat> make sure you maximize your, uh, your comfort so as not to uh, hurt yourself, also to help try and maximize your, your images. As you come up to the bed, go ahead and raise the bed to the height that works the best for you. I'm going to raise the bed up a little bit higher for myself so I don't have to hunch over. I can maximize the image. <clears throat> if possible, you should also always try to scan for the patient's right. Good point. Thank Sometimes you. our rooms aren't always set up to scan for the patient's right, but uh, it's really optimal uh, to scan for the patient's right because if you're right-handed because you can scan with your right hand and then you type on the keyboard or change your depth or your gain with your left hand. Uh, so I appreciate that when you guys are on with me, if you can do that, although I know some of the rooms aren't uh, perfect for that setup. So for the aorta study, <clears throat> we're going to start <laughs> high. Gonna <laughs> <laughs> keep going. The next application we're going to do is the aorta. So we've already put in our patient information. We've determined the probe that we're going to use, which is going to be our curvilinear C60 or our workhorse probe. Close up our workstation, and our patient is now prepped and ready to go. Here is one of the times we want to use a liberal amount of ultrasound gel. So we're going to start high up in the epigastrium at approximately the xiphoid process. We're going to work our way down to T10, which is the belly button and the bifurcation Dude, of that's the... Pretty liberal. That's a pretty liberal amount of gel. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. I agree with Rusty on this, on this point so, alone. Again, this is one of those critical points where you have to know where the probe indicator is in your hand and the screen indicator that is on your monitor here. The aorta and another vessel that resembles it very similarly called the IVC run parallel to each other and having these flipped would, be not, uh, would not be a good thing. So I'm going to start again with the, uh, with the indicator toward the patient's right. The very first thing I'm going to look on here is my screen indicator is, uh, is set. I know where my probe indicator is in my hand. I'm starting in the sub uh, right just, uh, just uh, below the sub uh, process. And I can see my depth is set about eight centimeters. So I probably need a little bit more depth than that. Uh, there are a couple of patients that, uh, that we get here at uh, UC Irvine from time to time that, uh, that have actually indulged at a place called McDonald's. And uh, these patients occasionally are, how do we say, rotund. These rotund patients are a little challenging to acquire images that are, are only about eight centimeters or so. As we come into the, uh, our first view, what we'd like to acquire on the screen is an image of the spine shadow. And this should be what your eye gravitates toward or your home base as you acquire this image. The spine shadow, as you can imagine, is going to be a curvilinear shape, hyperechoic, and then casting, as the name implies, a shadow distally to that. As all things here in California, we concentrate on real estate and sunglasses. So our real estate right now is a little bit wasted. So to do that, we actually do want to drop our depth down in this non-McDonald's indulging patient. We're going to maximize our picture just a little bit. 
we see immediately two dark fluid-filled structures, or dark structures potentially can, uh, containing fluid. Things that uh, are fluid are generally blood. We see a structure here and a structure here. The structure on the right side of the screen, left side of the patient, which has to do, which corresponds to the left side of the patient, is the aorta. The structure on the left side of the screen, which is on the right side of the patient, is the IVC. So you can see both structures, if we press hard enough, are actually a little bit compressible. So occasionally will cause a little Don't bit of distress as I try that again. Everybody gets oh, into your patient. That's so funny. <laughs> this should be avoided if possible. She's so, never coming back. Back to our image. <laughs> All right. So once your patient uh, stops laughing and relaxes their abdomen, or should they have a taut or a difficult abdomen, one trick to try is bend your knees, please. Yeah. Bend your legs. Yeah. I'm relax She's like, what are they doing abdomen. to me now? <laughs> that'll, that'll relax their abdomen just a little bit. So we're gonna come back up here into the belly. Just relax. And again, so our eye is gonna gravitate toward the spine shadow. We see the aorta. And now we see several structures that are coming off of this. The first that we see, that is just above the aorta. Just go ahead and just relax your belly there just a little bit. Coming off of the IVC, this structure right over here going from the patient's right to the patient's left kidney is the left renal vein. Above that is the first takeoff. I'm sorry, is the, uh, yeah, first takeoff. Second, I'm sorry, sorry, thank you. I'm, I'm getting a little corn fused. And uh, we'll cut that out of the video and go back up. <laughs> oh, we're keeping that in there. <laughs> I'm still like, trying to like keep like this uh, this like normal or the uh, a nice voice, a, uh, I guess a speaking voice. Uh, so very, very the, professional. Uh, yeah, thanks, Gene. So uh, so okay, all right. So here we go. So we see the spine shadow, and we see the aorta and the IVC. Coming off of the IVC is the left renal vein. Above the aorta and above the left renal vein, sort of nut cracking between the left renal vein and this large structure up here, which is the splenic vein, is the SMA. So the SMA, of course, is the second takeoff of the aorta, which means we need to come a little bit more proximally if we can, and we're going to look for the first takeoff of the aorta, which is the celiac axis. One way that we can try and enhance our image is by applying a little power flow here. We can set our box by hitting the set button. It gives us four corners to manipulate our box. Press set again and drag it over area of interest. Decrease our on that just a little bit. Oh, the color gain is on the CDI button. I just figured that out. Yeah. Did you turn the CDI knob? Yeah, the problem is our patient is just a little too wiggly worm over here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she's just in a little bit of a pain. So that's where we are. So we Always go. blame the patient whenever you can't get exactly. an image, by yeah. the way. That's so then we good go back to color flow. So we're going to drop our depth down just a little bit because as we slide down, keeping the spine shadow and the aorta and the IVC into view, we can notice our next takeoff is the SMA, which is coming out of the screen here. We slide down. We're going to decrease our depth now as the lordotic curve is going to push up the vertebral column. And we're going to maximize our image coming all the way down to about the umbilicus and then the bifurcation of the aorta, and that's at the bifurcation of the aorta. We're going to follow each iliac down as each iliac could independently have an aneurysm. Okay, and then, <laughs> so now our machine is set up and ready to go as uh, Dr. Fox and Summers uh, continue on with their important work. We'll continue in our part of work here. I'm uh, Brent Becker. I'm the ultrasound fellow for this year, 2010-2011. Uh, um, I'm just going to give you a basic introduction for uh, 
to the machining and kind of the ultrasound rotation in general. Um, so we'll just start with the basic machine. This is the SunSight Turbo. This is going to be your workhorse machine. Um, flip the screen out. Try to avoid putting stickers along here because it leaves all this nasty residue. So uh, first things first, you have a, a patient that you want to scan. We're going to talk about how to get the machine set up to record uh, so that it goes through and will be viewable in QA. So you boot up the machine with the power button. And then you're going to hit this patient button. And this gets you into the uh, screen where you can input uh, patient information. So you want to go to the new end and you can hit this button and it will clear this uh, slot here. So then you'll punch in the patient's medical record number here and then your uh, assigned initials. Uh, I'm Brent Becker so I'm BB and whoever else might be. Over here under exam you can select uh, the type of exam depending on which probe you have selected. So we'll just stick with abdomen and then you hit How are you the selecting button. things? What are you, what are you using as a mouse click to select? So there is a uh, mouse pad or a track pad here and the select button is what you uh, push to, to click. You know, it's the equivalent of a, of a mouse button. And show me the patient info button again. The patient button? Mm -hmm. Right there. Right there. Okay, got it. Point. Thank you. And that gets you back to the screen. And you can either uh, manipulate the screen with this trackpad, or you can use these buttons uh, along here, and they correspond to the display soft here. keys. Right. Good. Excellent. Okay. All right. Um, once you have the machine on, you have to plug it in in order to turn on the digital recorder, or the iRecord down here. Oh, it looks like your colleague already plugged it in here. Good job. Thanks, Connie. <laughs> we have a couple students here too with us also. Are they saying hi? Yep. Okay. So uh, you hit the power button here on the left of the iRecord. Mm -hmm. You got to hold it down. Hold down for a second. It fires up. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this is good. We can troubleshoot right off the bat. Yep. So it's not working, so we're going to make sure everything is plugged in properly. Spin this around so we can see what you're doing. Sure. So Got here's duct the, tape down the here. Power strip. <laughs> everything <laughs> seems to be plugged in properly, including the power strip itself. So let's mm -hmm. try this again. You don't want to hold it too long because it'll turn off. Mm -hmm. oh, maybe that's what's happening. We're holding it down too long. Now we're in business. All right. This is your indicator light. When it's uh, flashing green and flashing yellow, it's uh, kind of booting up. Once it turns steady yellow, it's ready to record. Steady, steady green. Steady green is ready to record. So once you've found something that you want to scan, you hit the record button. Flashing red indicates that it is actively recording. There it goes. That means everything is working fine and what you're doing is being recorded for QA purposes. If at any point you want to pause what you're recording, you hit the power button briefly and the light will turn to flashing green, alternating flashing red. And that, at that point it's not being recorded to the iRecord. If you want to resume recording, you hit the power button again and it goes back to flashing red. At any point you want to stop the recording completely, you hit this record button and it goes back to its ready state, which is solid green. Solid green. Dr. Fox, what happens when it's full? Oh, that's, I'm glad you asked me that. What happens when it's full? Well, if you look back here, this is the, um, the memory stick, the 64 gigabyte thumb drive that we have connected to it. And on the off chance that this could actually fill up, or if it's not correct, connected properly, for example, if this S-Video cable back here, if that's not all the way plugged in, see how this can come out of that, thank you, it comes out of the S-Video port, you have to uh, plug that back in there. And if, you, if it's not all the way snug in like that, or if that device fills up, which has happened a couple of times, pretty rare, but it can happen, 
then what happens down here is that light right there just basically is no longer solid green. So it looks, I just unplugged it, and you'll see now it flashes this kind of, uh, it's a steady amber. And when you try to record, it won't record. So if it's not a solid green when you're ready to go, then you're not ready to go. Great question. So moving along to uh, troubleshooting some of the, uh, the wiring in the back of the machine. This is your main power strip. It attaches to this gray cable here, which is now wrapped around the machine, but this needs to plug into the wall. Both for the machine to uh, charge. charged and also for the uh, iRecord to have power. So that's the first place I look when the things, people call me from home, the machine doesn't work. I check to make sure that this is plugged in right here and that all these other two connections um, are also plugged in. This is to charge the, uh, the battery on the machine and this one right here, if you follow this around, this is for the iRecord device. So the iRecord needs power and the machine ultimately needs power to charge this battery between exams. Um, so you can't record unless this is actually plugged in here and into the wall. Once again, the S-Video cable coming out of the back of the machine is snug in its spot and we have the memory stick coming in through this USB extender. And then on the recording device aspect, the US, the um, S-Video has to be snug coming into the device and then the power supply, it's kind of hard to see right there, but the power supply is also coming into the device and the USB extension cable is coming out the side. So <laughs> it's a lot of stuff to troubleshoot, but that's always the problem. When someone calls me, they can't get the machine going. It's all those connections have to be snug. So moving along to uh, troubleshooting some of the, uh, the wiring in the back of the machine. This is your main power strip. It attaches to this gray cable here. All right, so now you're done tinkering with the machine and the wiring and everything is working correctly. Um, just wanted to speak briefly about cleaning the machine. Um, before you use uh, the machine on anyone, you should make sure that it's clean. We have these cabby wipes here. Make sure you're wearing gloves when you handle them. And you want to get yourself a wipe. Whichever probe you intend to use, give it a good wipe down and let it dry before you use it. That should also be repeated when you're done, uh, both to clean the gel off the probe and also to disinfect it. You could wipe the keyboard down with one of these caddy wipes as well. The keyboard's a sealed unit. You can just give the whole thing a good wipe down between each, before and after each use. You should avoid using these on the screen, however, because it leaves a little bit of a residue. Um, Best way to clean the screen is with just using a paper towel above the sink, a little bit of water, wipe it off, and you're good to go. So let's talk about um, the probes very briefly. There's a number of different uh, probes that we have. The endocavitary probe that you're going to be using for your endovaginals uh, or your uh, peritonsillar abscesses. Where's the indicator on that probe? The indicator is... Um, basically where your thumb goes. The, uh, you have the trigger, mm -hmm. and then you have the top thumb rest, Good. Uh, and this is the, the probe marker. Excellent. There's also a little nub in here on the top. Yeah. This is your phased array. Uh, generally, it's a, a bit of a multi-purpose probe. It's good for uh, intercostal views uh, of the heart. Show the indicator. Indicator is this raised dot here. And also the, the little groove. Thing. And the groove along yeah. the side. Good. Always to the patient's right or to the head, unless you're doing peristernal long, and it's towards the patient's left head. But more on that later. This is your uh, linear short footprint. Um, usually this is going to be for vascular access, uh, uh, internal jugular, mm -hmm. central venous cath replacement. Peripheral the line. Probe marker here. Uh, is this raised ridge. Perfect. Another uh, workhorse probe is this uh, curved array. Um, 
This is good for abdominal, uh, it penetrates well, it will give you good resolution when uh, body habitus is... In the marker on that probe? Uh, on the probe marker is this divot. Actually, it's... Actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's this divot. It's that uh, notch thing right there. Yes, a com yeah. mistake commonly made. <laughs> commonly made. I'm glad you made it for us all. <laughs> and last but not least, it's the uh, larger footprint linear uh, array. This is your... Good marker. That's the indicator there. It looks like a little groove. If you look at it, you can palpate this little groove there. That's the indicator on the screen, on the, on the probe. How do we disconnect them? So, yeah, let's, so you, you want to use a, a probe that's not currently connected to this three-way selector. And as an aside, uh, in order to change which probe you're using, you just hit the button above the respective wire. Um, let's say, for example, that we would like to use the Endo, endo cavitary probe, and it's not plugged in currently. So, if you look underneath, there's a latch here that pulls down. Give it a turn, 90 degrees, and it'll uh, detach. Get the probe uh, board that you would like. Rotate it to the point at which it falls into place. There we go. And then it should. Nope. <laughs> Wait for it. Wait there for we go. it. So it should be flush with the bottom of the machine, and you should feel uh, a firm uh, locking when it's in there. The it goes. Position. Excellent. Okay, that pretty much sums up uh, what we need to know to start using the machine for scanning purposes. Thank you very much.